Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room today. I'm Alan Locker. And as I've said, I grew up watching As the World Turns and Guiding Light. I spent 13 years working in the PR department there before both shows went off the air. As I was stuck here in quarantine, I realized that I missed the shows I grew up watching and thought some of you at home might be feeling the same way as me. I know some of you have been asking me to bring some Landview residents onto the locker room. And today we have an incredible group of people here standing by to say hello to all of you. So let's get started. Cassie DePiver, who played Blair Kramer, James DePiver, who played Max Holden, Hillary B. Smith, who played Nora Buchanan, Robert S. Woods, who played Bo Buchanan, and Tuck Watkins, who played David Vickers, will be here shortly. And that's my fault, but he'll be here shortly. All right, let's say hello to everybody. Hillary, Bob, Cassie and Jim, oh. thank, you, thank you all for stopping by and saying hello. Our How's butt. everybody holding up? How's everybody holding up? Good. Right? Considering. Yeah, on the country, like uh, just another day. I mean, you know, you go to the store, you have to wear a mask and gloves, but otherwise just hanging out, watching grass grow. Yeah. Doing a lot of mowing. <laughs> A lot of mowing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so I, good to see you guys. I know. It's so I'm looking at all of you, and it's like, Cassie's got big, long hair now, and you has got big, long hair now, and Bo's got a big old beard now, and I'm just got glasses. I think that's the only change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got LASIKs a couple of years ago, so that's I can see. Oh, yeah. There you go. I was there. Well, I have my monocle. I'll wear that. Oh, excellent. Oh, I love that. So we can look even stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary, with your might be of a courtroom scene. That's what her. <laughs> yeah, she always wore them in a courtroom scene. Timely fashion. <laughs> oh God. They, they help with all the courtroom scene lines. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of this. Yeah. That's Courtney. so funny. Because all we did was sit there and listen to Hill, and she had all the dialogue. Go, go. <laughs> Bobby, you yeah. never had to wear glasses. It always surprised me that he would shrink his script down to about like this. And I couldn't see anything, and I had to wear glasses, and he would be just like, oh, yeah, I can see this. Do you still not wear glasses? Well, I don't anymore, but I just had uh, surgery with some lens implants or something. I, I, I don't know what you but it's really great no glasses i can all my all my uh sunglasses they still say ray-ban over in the corner yeah. oh wow That's yeah. is it the, is it the lasik surgery well no not not lasik this is a an, an actual implant that uh you get you get close and then you get distance and it was like an all-in-one thing it's uh oh, did you wow. have cataracts uh, yeah, yeah. It's usually done for a cataract surgery, and I had a guy that just said it was the most phenomenal thing he'd ever done. He could, he didn't need any glasses for anything. It's amazing. My mother-in-law the same thing. She said she threw out all her glasses. She had like trifocals. She got the lens implant, and she was like, "Well, this is great. I don't need any of these." That's good. Well, we, I, I, I have a friend. He's here. Sorry for the delay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Say, there he is. Where is he? All right. Well, 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 well. Who do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Tuck. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate well, it. Was it. Fun for everyone. <laughs> How are the kids? Tuck, how are the kids? Uh, they're seven and a half, Hillary. Yeah. Oh. They're great. We just finished first grade. Oh wow. Well. Are you home today, right? Today, yeah. right? Yeah, today. Today was the last day of school. We had to go to graduation from first grade, which is why you guys were kind enough to postpone this a little bit. Um, and we actually moved from Burbank to Sherman Oaks during our nation's pandemic. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. wow. that's fun. Is the Piper wearing a monocle? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, not really. Yeah, really. <laughs> Nip came for a minute and said hi to everybody and looked at Jimmy and asked Cassie how she liked being married to Charles Manson. Yeah. <laughs> By way of Jack Sparrow. That's what we're doing. Oh, <laughs> totally. Get a little uh, wow. in there too and Custer and 
This is oh, already the highlight of my day. See, everybody looks so great. Well, 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 those are so you. From what I can see, you haven't changed a bit, Tuck. No. No. Oh, uh, well, uh, thank you. I think Tuck's gotten better looking as he's aged. Uh, come on now. Yeah. I don't know. Where is everybody? Can't wait till tomorrow. We Did anyone... are in our, up at our Catskill house in a little cottage that has a sauna. The sauna is back here. I've this been is... in that sauna. I yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we are. Yeah. Okay. It's dead mouse smell in here. It's not Jimmy. But it's we had Rose Bagoza vodka in there, didn't we? Yes, we did. We drank uh, Rosa Bagoza vodka. <laughs> nice. What happened? What kind of vodka? what kind of vodka is that? It's, it's made with rose hips from from, from roses the yard. from rose hips. And I said, this is really good. We should mix vodka with that. I think it gives us a hundred percent vitamin C. Hundred well, percent. <laughs> An hour later, we're in the car and Hillary's looking for cigarettes. <laughs> now, we're going to find out some stuff on this little Zoom meeting that we <laughs> never intended to be learned, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It is we, we don't care we, anymore we, than we, When was the last time you all were together? The, this group? Oh, God. Well, well, I can tell you usually when Cassie. We were all together. Yes. You're, Cassie's went with you guys. You and Nathan brought those uh, wigs. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, when I was recovering from leukemia. Yeah. These was, people right here in this chat room were just so powerful, and it was overwhelming the love that I got from these guys, and I will never ever forget it. But that was four years ago. Praise God. So we definitely need to have another reunion of some sort without a disease. Without you needing a hat. Yeah, without me needing a hat or a wig. Right. Do <laughs> you remember we all went down to that courtyard in Fordham University and we sat around that sculpture garden and we played murder? Yes, yeah. that was so fun. Was it that was fun. Mafia or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I missed that whole thing because I had to get on a train and come back up here. So that was the next day, I think, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Right. That right. was Ford, Fordham in the Bronx. That's when Kramer showed up. It was Fordham uh, yeah. on the campus in uh, Lincoln Center or, or yeah. in the Bronx. Yeah. Yeah. It was the Southern campus where they have all those fire hydrants. All the notice fountains. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and Cassie, are you feeling great? I am feeling really great. Praise God. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, my life is, we're up here. We naturally quarantine anyway. We're kind of antisocial. So as Bob was saying, the only difference is we wear, you know, a mask and gloves when we go to the grocery store. But other than that, I put in a garden this year. I've just, we've just become regular farmers. Or the lumber yard, but nobody else wears one there. We're, we look very strange. <laughs> Those guys are bulletproof there. Now well, I can tell you, Jim, just say, just say anything. Just say anything, Jim. Anything. Yeah. <laughs> What, what what brought this on? Anything you say right now will be funny. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, see, I want to get a private text from you about what it's really like to spend the quarantine with Jim and that get up. <laughs> There's a reason we have three buildings on the property. That's right. <laughs> That's great. Well, I can tell you that there's a lot of fans here who are loving seeing all of your faces, saying how good everybody looks. Do you all remember your first days at One Life? Oh, I remember mine, yeah. First can you ahead. Back, back that far, Woodsy? <laughs> well, I was thinking, when kids graduating from the first grade, that was for me, that was 1954. So anyway, my first day on One Life was with Jeremy Plate, and uh, I had to make an entrance in Bo's Hotel Suite. The entrance was straight up stage, and I and Jeremy had a phone call. He's talking away on the phone, and I got bored back there, so I walked around the set to where the cameras were and peeked around watching him. Then all of a sudden, there was a sound effect of a doorbell, and he turned around and started walking to the door, and I'm watching him. I thought, holy I got to be there. 
And I ran around the set. And as soon as he opened the door, I just, I didn't even have to let up. I came right through the door screaming at him about something. That was my first established book. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. great. <laughs> yeah. Hillary, do you remember yours? Oh, yeah, I remember mine. My first day, um, I I had scenes with, with Woods. And um, it was a, we got in this huge fight. We had a huge fight. Um, somehow or other, I was telling him off, or he was telling me off. But we got into this fight sort of thing, and I got into the elevator after telling him he was some sort of caveman thing. And and Woodsy started yelling, but he started yelling like I was going down in the at the doors, and he just kept going down. I thought it was the funniest thing, and I went, "I'm going to have so much fun working with this man because he's so funny." Well, you, you know, recently I saw. His where we, I thought it was the first time that we came face to face and you spilled club soda on me or That's something. It. That was it. That was that, it. Okay. Yeah. That was, that was a good day. I thought yeah. you, <laughs> you see something like that you later and you're going, God, I get it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Was <laughs> it was a blast. I mean, it, it literally was so much fun. I mean, that was the beginning of 22 years of a lot of fun and a lot of good friends. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember my first day, but I remember my screen test with Robin Strasser. Oh, and I, wow. I watched the screen test. I was I was the last of I think eight guys to go up and do a scene with Robin. And at the end of the scene, I was supposed to surprise her by laying a big kiss on her. And by the time she had done it seven times, when I got up there to do it, she knew what was coming. And so when I leaned in to give her my smooch, she resisted me. And I thought, well, I better not force a kiss on this woman. So I laughed in her face, and then I stormed out the door. And apparently, Ellen Novak turned to Susan Benson Horrigan and said, "Well, if he's not afraid to laugh at her, we should probably hire that guy." <laughs> <laughs> I remember and watching that. I remember watching that though, Tuck, and she was like ready for it. She was like so ready for you to plan it on her. And yeah. when she didn't, it was like totally perplexing to her. I mean, her face just went through this whole range of different emotions. It was so funny. I saw them all up close in a close-up. <laughs> I was right there. I saw all <laughs> Tuck, did you know who Robin was when, for that audition? Like, had you known who Robin Strasser was at One Life? Uh, I, I did not. Like, were you were you nervous? You know, like in. You know what? I, now that you mentioned that, probably helped because I didn't realize that she was one of the grand dams of daytime, and um, uh, so I think if I had known that, I probably would have crumbled and fumbled a kiss somewhere, you know, on her chin or something. <laughs> they, they would have said, Next guy. So maybe ignorance was bliss there. Yeah, it's good. And Cassie and Jim, do you remember your first? Stop. Uh, first day was pretty unmomentous. Just Andrea Evans walks by and you check out her ass. That was about it. That was about <laughs> it. Uh, but on the, the audition, I flew out from LA and was great, went through it all. And uh, after it was done, they said, hang around. And they said, okay, we want you to do an improv with this other guy because they were looking for Steve and Max. And they said, okay, you play Steve. And you be Max with an improv. Said, no, no, wait. You be Max and you be Steve. I'm going to do an improv. Oh, wow. And he said, this is what the story is. And Larry Strack is up there going, are they just making this up? Is Larry this Strack <laughs> is a <laughs> cameraman. Man. Yeah, Larry's going, what, is this an improv? That, <laughs> so I, uh, it's uh, by the time I got to the airport, they'd call my agent and said, you got the job. So it turned Who around. Steve? What was the character of Steve? Steve Holden. Brother. He was blown up by his wedding cake. Oh, Russ, was that Russ, Russ Anderson? Russ Anderson. Yeah. Oh, man. That was before my time. Yeah. yeah. Jim, told me, Jim DePiva told me when I first started, he was sitting in the makeup chair and I was new. And he said, he said, look, <laughs> the only way to get through this, the only way I got through this in my first year, I was so booked with the lines, I would go home after each day. I would get a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I would eat the entire thing. Oh, my next day's lines. And that was my life for a year, kid. <laughs> kid. <laughs> so it was Terry Gideon fried rice from Empire Szechuan and Ben and Jerry's New York Super Fudge Chunk. And yep. put, on a, put on a sitcom for half an hour and 
that was my private life oh, for the first yeah. year. Yeah, I, I remember Empire Swesh, Szechuan on the Upper West Side. Yeah. <laughs> Empire Szechuan. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, my third was fifty-three pages, so I, was, I went, "How do you do this?" Luckily, it was so funny. Space, and it was on one third of the page. <laughs> okay, that's it. Well, on Woozy script, it was on one third of the page. <laughs> Oh yeah, the mini scripts. The mini scripts. Cassie, what was and, your and, first Yeah, and Cassie, yours? My yeah, first yours. day, gosh, of course I was a recast and they couldn't find a Blair. So I did three episodes. Back then they didn't do that, but I did three episodes in a bathing suit, thank you very much. <laughs> and they were scenes with Erica Slazak and Roy Thinnis and they had come down to do some type of investigation into Dorian, but I was connected, of course, to her. So that was that was me in a bathing suit, and that's been my. And, and I bet you didn't have a pint of ice cream the night before. No, I don't know. <laughs> I've played an aging slut ever since. So there you go. <laughs> I was basically living in someone's closet at that point too. It was, just, it was, it was a wonderful life. <laughs> Do you have a favorite scene of working with some of the folks here today? Well, I can say and that working with Bob Woods, I he always, his dressing room was across the hall from me. So I shared my lunch with him every day. And when we had scenes together, when he would try to be, because I, I was always in trouble and I would go to the police station. He's like, Boy, or, or, and he would, when he was always serious like that, he made me pee pee in my pants, laugh. <laughs> he was so funny. <laughs> so I'm like, God, I can't take you seriously. What? I'm, I, I'm trying to be tough here. I said, I don't know, but it's just funny. <laughs> I loved working with Bobby. Oh, that was fun. My favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes was with one of these people on the screen, but they were not acting that day. They were directing that day. I bet it's the same story I was going to tell just now. Really? Okay, I'll tell my version. You tell it. You tell your, tell your version. version. <laughs> <laughs> it was during the days when, when I was having sex with my sister on my life to live. And, um, well, I, I missed that in my research. Sorry. <laughs> and and Jim was directing us uh, a love scene. And um, yeah, I thought it was gonna be okay, it's gonna be one of those, you know, you kiss, kiss, you whip pan to the fireplace, we go to the next scene. But um Jim had uh Krista Tesro, who played the who was wonderful at playing Tina, um he choreographed some very um intricate and uh, progressive um, uh, moves. And I thought, are we gonna get away with this? And we shot it and we did, and it was really cool. There was like a mirror and there was someone on top and then someone flipping and then someone down. And it was it was pretty cool for the 90s. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done, Jim. Thank you. Well, I was thinking of another time when you and Krista were working and I directed you. And it was, and I, I remember going out and saying, okay, this is like a boxing match. And you're landing blows, and it's back and forth. And I really didn't know you that well at that point, Tuck. And as I, the first time I, I think I worked with you in any shape or form. And I just went, this guy is so damn funny. He's brilliant. Oh, my God. I I hadn't seen you do comedy up to that point. And that it was, I was just awestruck. And I, you know, when we saw it at the Cherry Lane Theater and everything like that, it just, I kept watching it get grow more and more. I go, this guy is just so good. It's unbelievable. Do you remember his scenes with, uh, with Nathan Fillion and Gina? The three of them? Gina Tanyoni? Mm -hmm. Yes, the three of them. Remember when she I, first came on? She was with the Dissy yes. Love yeah. and with The three of you, you, Nathan, and Gina had these scenes together that were so funny. Oh my God, it was peeing um, everything. Kind of cat. Um, I got all my comedy training for the one from the one episode of Baywatch that I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Me too. Me too. That's right. <laughs> Cassie and I have very similar lives. We both went to Indiana University. We were both on Baywatch. We were both on One Life to Live. We both did Castle. There's other stuff, right? We both had the same, agents. We both had the same commercial agent. Oh, right. Sonia Warren Brandon's commercials unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> Were you lifeguards on Baywatch? 
No, I played this guy in a cardigan sweater and loafers. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the only guy on Baywatch ever to wear a cardigan. And my wife jumped in a swimming pool with the oversized engagement ring that I gave her. She got it stuck in the drain. And Billy <laughs> Warlock, who's a friend of mine now and a good friend of Bob's, who was on Daytime for a long time and Baywatch, he was the series regular lifeguard. And he jumped into the pool and saved her while I walked over to the pool pump and went click and turned it off. And then I came back to say, hey, back off. I'm a doctor. I can save her. And then Erica Eleniak said, you back off. He's a lifeguard. <laughs> so, Are you trying to kill her? Uh -oh. No, I, I wanted to save her life, but I was just a guest star. They had to let the series regular save her life. Um, okay. Okay. You know what I used to love, Chuck, is all the names that you came up with for uh, Rob when you're in a scene. My little, you know. Peach Pit. Trevor. Yeah. All those um, nicknames. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, 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 she likes some of them. <laughs> they're, yeah. all, they're all hilarious. <laughs> yeah, you, do you remember the scene that we did with Nigel, where I, I forget what it was? We were. It was when we found out that you were in fact were my son, and that we're outside of uh, Aces. And I said, "Okay, Dave, but we get in there. You don't say anything. You understand." Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Knock on the door, walk in. There's Nigel. I said, Nigel. And then you launched in, and I didn't say another word for like three or four pages. <laughs> Peter Bartlett was a great comedic actor, too. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. He has great. I had, to, I had to just stand there and like chew on my cheeks on the inside because the two of them, forth and Peter's doing all his frantic stuff and tucks in his face. Well, you and I had a great complimentary relationship. We were very opposite, weren't we? And that that yeah. makes, that makes for some for some good uh, drama. Didn't you call him Pop? No, Paul. 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 That's it. Paul. <laughs> like we called Billy Paul, and he called me Paul. Right. He's my Paul. <laughs> David in the middle, loved the Middle East. Bob Buchanan's son. Bob Buchanan was not as happy. David Vickers was his son. <laughs> I thought it was. That's great. <laughs> who, who or what was the biggest influence on, on leading you down the acting path? Well, is something... that a good path or a bad path? <laughs> yeah, a good path. path. The girl I had a crush on in seventh grade. Oh, okay. She said, we need people for this uh, Shakespeare play, and, and we need guys, so... Would you do it? And I'm going, sure. And I was snug the joiner. I had my three lines and and it was and I went, oh, this is fun. Then I grew eight inches and dropped 20 pounds the next summer and I was a leading man. And I went, they kept making me kiss girls. I went, somehow this is working for me. <laughs> Anybody else? I just just in junior high and high school in the our speech and debate and theater company. Just started there and you know I thought I would never be you know I thought I'm going to grow out of this or I don't know just I didn't know I could make money doing it <laughs> <laughs> no one did <laughs> so. when I was in college I majored in radio television film but every time the project somebody else's project I didn't get picked for camera or sound anything like that I was always talent in the front because in our department we had some of the worst actors in the world and we pulled from the department for uh, films and television. So that was my little intro. Zach? Um, I'm just thinking of, the, I actually do remember something from my first day now, which I think was the, probably the biggest, probably the biggest influence I had out. I went to, I went to acting school. I took acting classes, but the thing that I learned the most was from Eric Blazak on the first day where I was, I kept asking lots of questions to the director to show the director that I was smart. And Eric, Eric do you remember what the right, do you remember Eric what the right the side And she said, stand in the light, don't move, say your lines. I know it feels awkward, but we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> I got good advice about one life to live from David, the maestro. 
at my screen test. My screen test was with Woodsy. We had a couple of scenes, but after we did the first scene, he came out to give me a note and he walked up to me and with his back to the camera and he said, I'm going to talk to you and you're going to nod your head. <laughs> you do that? And I went, yes. And he goes, okay, now I want you to smile at me and nod your head. So I <laughs> nodded and then he goes, okay, we're going to do the scene again. And he walked away and I went, wait, 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 wait. What, what was that? And he goes, they thought I was giving you a note that I didn't agree with. So we're well, good. Go ahead, let's do it again. <laughs> That's oh great. I love that. You never gave me the note, and I went and did the scene again, and they went perfect. Thank you. you know, that was the half the job of the director is translating whatever came from the back of the room to an actor without yeah. the actor drawing furniture. Yeah. Which is <laughs> that is the best advice I've ever gotten before I even gotten the job on One Life to Live was that two percent note or that you know just. Just know that there's a note out there and then let it go and do your thing. Hmm. You must have had a hard time keeping a straight face on, on set with Bob and Tuck and Jim. They all seem like they have incredible senses of humor. We had a really wonderful group of actors and a great rapport. We spent a lot of time together at the, at the studio before rehearsals and such. And afterwards we would get together and that's one great thing about New York city. You would go have drinks and do whatever, but there's such a great camaraderie with the one life to live family. And I'm sure they're with other shows too, but it's just, it's really special. And I think it really shows when I go back and I look at uh, YouTube clips of the show, it just seems so real because everybody's so naturally connected and I, I it's hard to explain but that's I think it's a great I, I do think it's a New York thing for sure too I, I hear it from a lot of casts and you were in that great castle <laughs> oh um, yeah right I was a page in ABC. One door in and one door out so you know you couldn't hide from anybody you were <laughs> when you went into work they knew it when you left work they knew it yeah. Did you guys know where the secret entrance to the roof was from up in the flies? Yes. Yeah. Back, in the, back in the days where you could still get in trouble for stuff and not get fired. Yeah. Um, Nathan <laughs> and Roger Howarth and Chris Douglas and I, we'd go up to the roof. We'd take off our shirts. We'd sit in the sun. We'd smoke cigarettes. We were smoking and joking. And one day... Because the, the castle where we shot the show was directly across the street from the glass tower where all the executives were. <laughs> we, were we were these knuckleheads that didn't know that our bosses are in their windows going, what the? And we, we all got in trouble and they're like, you guys, you can't go up on the roof and take your clothes off and smoke cigarettes. So I thought, we're on a soap opera. Isn't that exactly what we should be doing for marketing? Or, or why are we getting in trouble for this? Shouldn't we be required to do this? <laughs> I got a lot of money from the Dick Clark bloopers show, especially the scene where I had with Philly. He kept crossing his eyes, and he made me laugh. And I would start out, and then he'd he'd cross his eyes at me or make a face and I'd start laughing and then they'd cut to him and his face would be normal. And it went on and on. And I literally, they started getting mad at me. I could not get through this scene because he just, he, I'm not doing anything. Look at her. She's just making him. I mean, he was just always that way. Yeah. Are there other scenes like that that you recall that you just couldn't get through because somebody was doing something? Uh, Jim DePaiva and I had a scene that was supposed to be kind of a love scene. And I I couldn't, I just started laughing because we were really good friends. And uh, he started doing that little sexy thing that he does. And I just started laughing. And he was like, Hill, you got to stop it. You got to help me out here. I was like, I can't. That's kind of how I felt when I was working with Bob. He was like, be really serious. I'm going, he's just so funny. I'm like, sorry, Bob, you can't do it. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'll get it better. And then you hear him over the intercom. All right, we're pushing you to the end of the day. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, I got it. I got it. I, I, I won't laugh. Sorry. Bob was like ne Leslie Nielsen because he could always say the funniest things in the driest voice. And you'd have to think, Wait, did he just say that? You'd have to keep up with him. 
he had a really unique sense of humor for that format, I thought. Mm. Yes. The one time I didn't stop, Jessica Tuck had just started the show and she was playing a soap opera actress shooting at, at the Holden Towers. My, and they asked me to play a waiter since I own the hotel. And in it, supposedly, I pour salt in her drink because she's pissed me off and she's supposed to gag on it and everything like that. So we do dress and everything. And she does her thing and everything like that. So then I walk back and I go to the prop guy and said, no. I just started dumping containers of salt in the water she was about to drink. And so then when she went, she just like took a big gulp like she was going to do it. And you just started to stop. Yeah. <laughs> and then, it went, then she went crazy. And then she chased me all over the entire studio. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hey, hey Bob, uh, one of the fans, Matthew, was asking, can you talk about the Bucky boys, share some Phil Carey? And Clint Ritchie uh, stories. Gosh, uh, yes. <laughs> There's no censor now. Yeah. You can go for it. <laughs> There's some of them that we, uh, I don't know. You know, when we first started, we used to have a, a complete run through dress and uh, we shot the show in order and everything else. And we, we started going out to lunch and, um, was there time got oh, back, the yeah, acting we, coach? Yeah, the coach yeah. and and the um, once we got through uh, dress rehearsal was all right, but those the dress rehearsals were could be crazy, uh, and and then by we everything settled down by the time we actually taped it, and I don't know, there there are all kinds of uh, Philly stories. Bucky Bucky was much more serious than Philly. And uh, Bucky was Clint, mm -hmm. uh, but Phil, like like uh, Hillary was saying, he could he could really mess with you. I I I used to write my uh, lines. Sometimes I'd write on the wall. I had a hard time saying a line, so I wrote it just over his shoulder. I turned him around, grabbed his arm, turned him around. We got through dressed, and I thought, oh great, I got through there. We went to tape. And then when I turned him around, he shifted and stood right in front of where I'd written my oh. line and just gave me that look and like he knew it. And he knew it too, didn't he? Gotcha. Oh yeah, he's looking at me like that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's stuff like that. But we got him plenty too. I I used to stay up. Oh, I used to drop a bat on a string when he was in jail and have it dance chicken. around. The chicken from the top, you used to mess with him all. I was yeah. up there. You took me on the catwalk for the first yeah. time. Bobby spent a lot of time on the catwalk. He was yeah. the biggest uh, prankster in the studio. And he really, really messed with Phil Carey. It was hilarious. Yeah, I still was... have that chicken. Oh, that chicken? Yeah, the rubber chicken. You got you me have it? That. You got me good with that. Oh, yes. Well, more than once. I mean, that time with you and Nathan, though, when, it's, when it stayed in camera, <laughs> on that bread it was just bouncing and you slugged it like it was a punching bag. <laughs> when you're, when you're always there doing a scene with Phil Perry, it's really scary. And I, the first time I did it, it was in the hospital waiting room and I was pleading with him about something and I fumbled a couple of my lines and they said, cut. And he started to walk away and I said, aren't we going to do it again? He said, I just give him one take. <laughs> 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 Phil. Phil said, I've got 85 pages to learn today. He'd have two lines on page 85, and that would be, I had 85 pages to learn today. And the other thing was, you know, you can't just memorize, but you can't just sit on this stuff and have it come up through your ass. You actually have to memorize it. That was one of the words of that was was it. Of Moses through the ass. But you talk about the, the Buchanan boys. What a phenomenal casting, and you guys were so real and enjoyable to watch. I, I just, I love the connection. It was, once again, very natural because you guys got along so well. Cassie, did you watch the show before? I watched the show. I remember when the Buchanan Boys came on the show. I loved it. Yes. I was I like, to it. watch Bo with my mom. Uh, I was going to ask you, you were, uh, I was surprised to read that. You were a soap fan before. Oh God, yeah. Oh yeah, me too. I just I, I worked in the music store, and then I would rush home and watch 
the soaps with my mom. One Life to Live was my favorite, but when the Luke and Laura thing happened, my boss kept saying, why are you taking such a late lunch? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, because I, I, you know, been doing this since about April 3rd, and every show it's an actor who, you know, was cast on a show that they watched. What was that like? I mean, were you intimidated when you first walked through the door knowing that you had grown up watching it? Well, I personally get, I'm nervous every single day. The minute they go five, four, three, two, one, I'm like, whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm, I'm still nervous. Um, it does maybe get easier sometimes, but um, I, you know, you you become a fan of these people, so you it takes it definitely takes a while to go. Oh my God, that's Bob Woods. That's Bo. Okay, I'm gonna be like, okay. yeah, it's crazy. I mean. Cassie, I met you when you were at Guiding Light, when you played Chelsea. What was that like? Do you? I mean, that was your first big role, right? Uh, it took me two years to find. I was there for four and a half years, but for the first two years, I kept thinking, well, they're going to fire me. They're going to find out that I'm a fake. So it's like, oh, my God. But I remember at that time when I was on Guiding Light, Hillary was doing As the World Turns. Yeah. And, and, of course, then... I was a PNG girl and she was PNG and I followed CBS and kind of grew up watching ABC. But, um, you know, and then you, then you just trying to make a living. And when, once I was on a soap, I kind of stopped watching them cause I didn't have time to do anything other than learn my lines. <laughs> yeah, I just, so bad. I used to watch ABC all day long from, from Ryan's Hope down to Edge of Night, and then I would watch the Doctors. I'd watch the Doctors. I mean, I, I don't know how I ended up watching so many of them, but I did. General Hospital. I remember the whole, you know, back in the days with the Brewer family and the Bauer family on Guiding Light, and you know, some when I was a kid. So that was that's all I ever wanted to do was a soap opera. The yeah. first one I watched Guiding Light. Because it was on CBS, they used to have reruns of All in the Family in Los Angeles that came on at two o'clock. Guiding Light came on at one thirty. It was a half hour then. So I sit down a little early with lunch, and pretty soon I started eating lunch at one thirty instead of you know two. Because <laughs> I pulled into it, this nasty guy, Michael Zaslow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh my. Roger Thorpe. Yeah, and this little cute nurse named Rita. And so I got sucked into the guiding light then. And yeah, Rita Bauer, yeah. That's yeah. crazy. And Tuck, you joined One Life in, in, one, uh, in 1994, and you tell this story of how you figured out who David was on set. Do you remember? You, you, you came on as a cool cat, but you tell the story of you figured out how he was. I do remember, I do remember the day that I, <clears throat> So I figured out uh, who David Vickers might be because the, for the first year I was hired to play this cool, mysterious con man. And there are other people better suited to play cool, mysterious con men than me. And um, I was I was doing my job, but it was I was just kind of unremarkable at it. I thought. And um, one day I was I was um, I fell down the stair. I, I think I fell up the stairs actually, which is even funnier. <laughs> you fall up the <laughs> I fell up the stairs unintentionally and everyone laughed and initially I was humiliated. And then I had like this sort of epiphany that I thought, Oh, that's who David Vickers is. He, he's not a cool, mysterious con man. He thinks he's a cool, mysterious con man. <laughs> and that's where everything clocked. And um, that's where I started doing things that Robin would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> Um, but you know, when you're on a show like that with 35 people and each person fills a different color of a tapestry and you feel like you're redundant or unremarkable, you fear that you're going to lose your job. And I didn't want to lose my job. And so I thought, um, I can't, I'm not doing this thing. Well, I'm, this is not working out for me. I need to do something different. And when that happened, I thought, you know, there aren't a lot of people who are willing to look like an idiot. Uh, on daytime because we're, you know, we're supposed to be cool, collected, attractive people. Um, and so it was, 
uh, it was somewhere in 95, I think, 95, 96, that that, that occurred to me. And um, the producers kind of went, uh, okay, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's where the David Vickers that came to be on and off for the next 20 years was born. That's good. Hillary, a fan just asked, is, could you describe how World Turns and One Life were different? Oh, oh, that's easy. I was really smart on One Life to Live and I was much more blue collar on as the world turns. <laughs> um, um, I, uh, I, you know, I had such a great time on As the World Turns. I mean, I really had um, I made some really lifelong friends on that, Scotty Bryce and Benjamin Hendrickson. Um, you know, I just, I, I really had, it was really family, Larry Brigman and Don Hastings. And um, and so it was, it was kind of a place for me to grow up. I got married when I was on the show. I had my babies when I was on the show. One of my kids played my kids on the show. But he, he played Adam, right? He played baby Adam. Adam, exactly. Yeah. And so it was really, um, it was time for me to leave because I kind of had gotten to the point where I needed to grow more and I really didn't feel that there was any more room to grow. I, you know, so when I left there, it was sad because I felt like I was leaving home. And then when I came back to daytime and to have it be um, the same time as One Life to Live, I, I do remember calling Douglas Marlin and saying, hey, Doug, you know, One Life to Live, it's the same time. And I just wanted to let you know. And he was like, oh, thank you so much. He was, he was really sweet. One Life to Live, when I came on, I, I, I really honestly felt that I spent the first, I don't know, 10 years still exploring this character. And I knew she was smarter than I was. And it's really, I, I found it hard. I don't know, Tuck, but I find, I find it hard to play anyone smarter than me. Because, you know, you gotta, you got to reach somewhere to find something. And I wasn't finding a lot. So I just kind of relied on words and talking. <laughs> <laughs> if they talk smart, then she was smart. But um, so that was kind of the difference. Margo was very blue collar and, you know, did a lot of um, heroic things. She was very heroic. Um, Nora was very happy to stand behind Bo and for protection, but she was really <laughs> smart. <laughs> Tell them about Benjamin, what Benjamin and I had in common with our. Uh... Uh, Benjamin Hendrickson had a little spot on the back of his head. He was very vain. And so he. Would oh, my be... God. I love that Bob just said that. <laughs> <laughs> he would put this powder on the back of his head. And in my dressing room, there was always a brown spot on the wall where he'd come in and lean against the wall and he'd run lines. So. When I was working with Woodsy one time, he leaned against me and when he put his head away. There was this big brown spot on my shoulder. Sort of caress. I, I know what this is. <laughs> There's my hair on her blouse. <laughs> oh my God. That's a great story. Bob, I, I, I just got to say thank you for your service to our country. Um, You're welcome. I, when I was, that's pretty amazing. Uh, can you share any memories of you know what that time was like for you? Uh, oh, well, it was it's it's a bizarre time because it's very intense, but it has nothing to do with the rest of your life, really. It's but I've got a lot of memories of it over here in the bookcase and stuff. Kind of, a, I'll show you something. He's got fabulous pictures. In the meantime, Cassie will show us the swimming suit she was wearing in nineteen ninety. <laughs> Yeah, well, oh, forget this thing. I want to see the. This. <laughs> this is my little, my old dog tags. Oh wow! They're all they're, they're sort of a plastic thing, so that they don't make any noise. So it's very, you know, they don't rattle. And then my old hat, and wow. uh, on a wooden head, which <laughs> kind of appropriate. But thanks oh, for. Uh, Thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Oh, on the studio, in the studio in his in Bo's office, there were pictures, real real pictures of you with with that tiger. Oh, and, uh, there's there were some paraphernalia out there, memorabilia that real real 
Bob yeah. Woods memorabilia in yeah. Bo's office. Oh, wow, that's great. I was that's just great. talking to Fipsy, my son, and he, one of his earliest memories of me being on One Life to Live was getting the flight suit from Bob. Bob got him a flight suit. And he loved that flight suit. It was like the one you wore around the studio all the time. Yeah, my board, my uh, dressing. Uh... Yeah, it was a jumpsuit, a yeah. airman jumpsuit. And he would wear this thing all the time. And I mean, even when he started getting too big for it, he would still try and zip it up with his. <laughs> and you got him a green beret hat, too. And you. I remember that. It. Very cute. Bob and I were. Um, you know, wasting time between setups in his office in the 90s and all those great pictures that you're talking about were up on the wall. There's a really handsome picture of Bob, probably wearing that exact cap. And I was just making small talk and I didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, were you in Korea? Oh, yeah. And, and he looked at me like, no, you I'm way too young to be in Korea. Do you not know history at all? That is also what set up David and those I do remember that. I remember that because you asked, uh, you look at the picture and you said, what war was this anyway? <laughs> oh my God. What a great line. And then, then I told that story so many times because I thought it was funny. And you finally asked me once you said, you know, seriously, why don't you quit telling that story? <laughs> Here, I, bring it up again. I think it was the last time until just now. <laughs> yeah, my own fault. Thanks for sharing it. Hey, Jim, did you live next door to Mariska Hargitay? Yes. And did she name her cat after your no, one life? Um, I had started or one life to live. I started one life to live. And before that, you know, I was waiting tables. And Mickey Hargitay, her dad, built the house. And this was on a very steep hillside up in Hollywood. And we'd sit, and I'd sit there and chat with him. And I think Mariska had done... Uh, something like downtown or some other series at the time. And, but uh, God, I think Grace, there was an actress on my life lived. Grace was a whole bunch of them lived there. And it was all these young women that would run around wearing nothing but a t-shirt. So uh, it was interesting time, but I was only there. I, never heard that I was only there for a brief time because I was doing one life to live in New York, but yeah, Mariska was there and Oh, her dog. Uh, my yeah, wife, her, then my wife at the time, Misty said, well, if you really want to piss Jim off, name the dog Max. So she did. And then we ended up inheriting the dog for the next 15 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you got the dog. Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter ended up with him. That's so funny. Um, what are some of your favorite stories? Or, you know, or no, sorry, not stories. What was your favorite part of playing the characters you played on One Life? I got yeah, to there something. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorites. What's that? I got to we got to dance together. Oh yeah, God. We've been asking to dance together for like a year and a half before they finally went, okay, okay, we'll let you dance together. And then it and, became our thing. And then they had that contest. We ended up with Ben Gay all over our you know. Oh, the tiger body <laughs> smell. <laughs> From hurting yourself? Yes, from rehearsing. We were so. Yeah. Loyita came and helped us because she's a dancer, and his Bob's wife. And I, I mean, literally, by the time we got to shooting the scene, we reeked of eucalyptus tiger bomb. We were so sore. <laughs> yeah, they they had a the uh, they yelled cut and the music ended. And remember, we were like exhausted, and all of a sudden the music came right back on, and we just went no. <laughs> Yeah. Cassie, will you tell the story about um, the maple syrup and the satin underwear and the blonde wigs that you were loving? <laughs> okay, so we're doing the Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe switch off. It's Halloween and we're dressing up in costume and it's a Dorian and Blair caper. And they, we, Dorian has tied David Vickers to a bed. He has satin little he's oh. on and blindfolded him and i'm there i don't know why i am in there but i were trying to get information and i'm supposed to seduce i am supposed to seduce david and we pour baby oil all over his body 
and I don't, I, I just remember it being ridiculously funny, but it was like, and the costumes were fantastic. Susan Gammy designed, you know, through, you know, Dorian and I tried to look alike, but she had a blonde wig on. Um, and it was from Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend costume. Well, but, I thought you said, uh, didn't you say that it was maple syrup? Because that's when I said, I am your hot cake on the griddle of love. <laughs> I remember some of that stuff. I only know that I remember one scene that I, I thought was really good that I did with you. And I was going, you know, I should submit this for the Emmys. It was with, 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 with David. And I showed Jimmy this reel. He goes, Cassie, you can't show that. Because my character had brain surgery. And it looked like, I, you know, my hair was like this. And it looked like I just had a Kotex stuck yeah. on top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Silly. You, you guys really didn't have any fun together. I can totally oh, tell that. Oh you know, at that point, we had to stop everything because something would happen and we were just laughing. I mean, it was it was hilarious. Oh, the live shows. That was the scariest thing when we did the live shows. I was scared to death that that was going to happen. And the one thing I said to Gary Tomlin was, well, and he said, we're going to do everything in the live shows. So Cassie DeFiva had to cry. Every day. She was brilliant. You were brilliant. She had the hardest stuff she ever had to do. And that was, you submitted yourself. You were nominated for an Emmy that year. And you should have won because it was all live, her work. And, and I And the one thing that he said was, we're going to have this. We're going to have that. We're going to have a location. And we're going to have bed scenes and stuff. And I was laughing going, well, I better not have the bed scene. <laughs> yes, and I had the bed scene. Do you mean that dancing? Didn't you have some with Roxy in the live week? In the live week? And y'all, yes, you had that. No, I, it was me and Ty Treadway. So. Oh, shoot. And he rolled over and took the sheets with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> the old tuck and roll. <laughs> oh. The old tuck and roll. Well, my biggest fear that I was just going to be out there. Yeah, what well, like Bob, Bob, do you remember when you were before you got married near the end, you were in a bathtub full of tomato juice and there were like eight men, there were eight of us standing around you. What why were you taking a, a bath in tomato juice? Stop. Stop. I don't I don't remember. I remember that though, the tub in the middle of the room all of a sudden yeah. was a bathtub. And we're all standing over you like I think you got it was your bachelor party and you got stuck get sprayed by a skunk, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Was that what it was? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. But they I mean, make you sit in that damn bathtub filled with actual tomato juice yeah. forever. Yeah. God, I forgot about it. You say tomato, I say tomato. Yeah. She said how, how many of you have gone on YouTube and seen a scene and you said, I never shot that? I never oh, did. I, that. No. All the time. I think I, I remember. All the time. <laughs> you're, remember still, you're still young. <laughs> There's a lot of things I don't remember anymore. Oh God! <laughs> probably wise. It's probably best. Yeah. I was told. Does to anybody know how many episodes they shot? Oh no. A lot. <laughs> do you know how many episodes we shot? No, I don't. Oh, you didn't do your research. <laughs> yeah, I did not. Seventeen. How many shows of One Life to Live were there? Well, near the end, I remember they used to number the scripts, and I feel like. One of the last numbers I remember was in the four thousands. Does that sound right? No, no. thirteen thousand. It was no. like oh, it's thirteen thousand. Forty thousand. I'll I'll check out. I'll check out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I would say it, it's got to be somewhere where Jim says. I mean, Guiding Light when it went off was probably about I think seventeen thousand. Well, there were seven. I was there for the five thousand show anniversary and the ten thousand anniversary. So it had to be a lot more than that because I love it. That's what I wanted to say. It's like thirteen or fourteen thousand. <laughs> well, how many shows did we do a I'm year? Right. I mean, Andrew Blazak was there for thirty years, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. Eric, you probably did around two two fifty, I think, two sixty yeah, something. Five like times fifty is two fifty plus ten, so that's yeah. two hundred and sixty work days. I should have been a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> Because there, there were no holidays, we we aired every day, right? So that's two sixty weekdays yeah. a year. No, but really then we started, started breaking up scripts, and we had to do multiple 
shows in one day. Like you could end up doing four shows in a yeah. day if you. Yeah. That, I started losing my mind. Yeah, it's hard. And I think daytime now they stack those shows up. I know on Days of Our Lives, they do parts of like 15 episodes in one week and it can be crazy. Well, we were shooting stuff that we hadn't, we were shooting scenes from shows that we hadn't shot the shows coming before it. Right. So we were so out of order. Wasn't it Susan Haskell that was had a whole scene and, and it wasn't until uh, just before she went up there that she found out that she actually had done this deed that she was defending herself on, or I mean, I don't know, but she was, it was after, I don't know. It was, it, it was so discombobulated towards the end. It was really hard to figure out whether you're telling the truth, whether you were lying or, you know, or what, or you thought it was funny or what you had overheard. Um, what I think was great about one like to live. And I think it was a lot of it was under Gary Tomlin's umbrella it's like we did the musicals. We, we went out on a limb and did things differently than other soaps did. We had a lot of music and Frank Valentini put a lot of musical uh, numbers and we did, we did musicals. We did the musical numbers. Um, Little Richard at your all's wedding, which was so cool. Yep. And then yeah, they animation. I just think that we, we were kind of an old fashioned soap, but we were progressive outside of the box, of it, which made it interesting. Yeah. Somebody just said it's about 252, I think, a year that we would do in daytime. Right. 252. Take that in. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot in one year. Um, Cassie, will you, do you know if you'll be going back to Days? Fans were asking as well. I have, uh, I am, you know, Days shoots eight months ahead of schedule. So I shot some episodes back before Thanksgiving of last year and in January of this year. So I think I'll start airing in July, August. Oh and my God. Right. Wow, Did eight it? months. I've yeah. never heard that. Yeah. 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 Wow. It was crazy, but it worked out, didn't it? Yeah. Who knew it, that? Yes, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Unbelievable, so, right? They have, they yeah. have the foresight to, to, to see that. Well, I'm upset because Tuck's show, which is so good, Black Monday, I only got half of it. Right, Tuck? We only got- You'll get the, the other half, half in June. <laughs> oh, good. I, it's a great, I, I, it's no, a great I know, show. I don't know why Showtime decided to break that up, but they're going to uh, split the season. I think Black Monday is thinking that they're a lot like Game of Thrones. And so <laughs> they want to split their season um, so that people will talk about it in between, but it comes back in June, I think June 24th. Have you shot the whole season? Yeah, we finished it back in, I think, November. Okay, so then they aired, started airing it. When did they start airing it? Uh, I think they started I airing it Jan February January, or March. Was it? Yeah, oh, maybe. It was February, March, or January, Hillary. <laughs> well, thank you, Tuck. <laughs> um, are you having a blast on that show? Yes, I... Um, I, I play the the love interest of my real life love interest. So it sounds more like a soap opera. <laughs> um, <laughs> Andrew Rannells uh, and I met doing Boys in the Band on Broadway in 2018. And um, uh, we, we played uh, partners, we played boyfriends in the play and near the end of the play, uh, life started imitating art and um, then we went away for a year. I went back to Kansas City, where I lived for three years, actually. And uh, he went back to uh, L.A. And then we came back together to shoot Boys in the Band for Netflix, which will be out in October. And then um, I was hired uh, to do season two of Black Monday. So that's pretty cool. We're the new Jim and Cassie. What? <laughs> the new Jim and Cassie. Oh, Jim and Cassie. Oh, yeah. It's We're, working well, out. You get Talk, I'm very much enjoying enjoying your role on Black Monday, but I, I did get to see you and Andrew in Boys in the Band, and it was phenomenal. All of you together. It so was good. So yeah. good. And I'm, I'm so, I'm glad you, you basically answered a lot of my questions and the fans, because they were asking if you had already filmed Boys in the Band so that they can expect it coming soon. So I, I was told it's October 2nd, they're going to put it on, I think they're going to release it uh, and they're going to put it on Netflix because it was produced 
by Ryan Murphy for Netflix o- October 2nd. Um, an interesting soap opera tie-in to Boys in the Band, the original play was done in uh, 1968, and we rebooted it at its 50th anniversary in uh, 2018. The part that I played was originally played by an actor named Larry Luckinbill. Larry Luckinbill oh, yeah. was married in real life to Robin Strasser, who I was married to on television four different times. So and <laughs> another story back to Tuck getting the play. Susan Batten is very good friends with Joe Mantello. Tuck was in the middle of doing a play in Kansas City. He's like, I can't go out, come out to New York for a day to audition. But she goes, I'll get your ass here, do this play. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to audition. And so Susan kind of got him a play and a boyfriend. So there Susan you go. has done nothing but yell at me for a quarter of a century. <laughs> Susan, Susan basically changed his life, really. She did. I, I have her. <laughs> I, 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 I paid for it. Yeah. And when, we, when my kids and I were in New York doing that play, Robin was kind enough to let us stay in her townhouse that summer. So. It is a small world, isn't it? How all this stuff kind of comes together. What was the experience of doing that play as a gay man? I mean, it must have been really rewarding. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was actually pretty cool that um, nine um, openly gay actors played those parts because 50 years ago, um, none of them were out. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of tragedy involved with that play because it was, that plays about, um, you know, the self-loathing that gay men had mid-century. And it was sort of a, a peephole into that apartment to see how we treated one another. And it wasn't very kind. It was acerbic and funny, but it got pretty dark. And, um, you know, a lot of those guys, uh, most of the uh, gay guys in that, that play that, that went on to do the movie, they died and they, they, they died of AIDS. And so did um, the producer and um, I believe the, the director of the play. So to be able to do that play 50 years later with other out gay actors and, you know, at the end of that play to come to the lip of that stage and, and hold hands and, and um, sort of take a bow and sort of realize how far we have come. And, you know, it, it kind of felt like this sort of gay justice league. Um, because we were really standing on the shoulders of giants of those who came before us, and it was a real honor. And you've also got Ryan Murphy producing it, Joe Mantello directing it, Mark Crowley, who wrote the play, um, uh, was was also working with us. So it it really couldn't have been a better experience. In fact, it's the first time I've done Broadway, and I think I'll never do Broadway again because it can't get better than that. It it was spectacular. Before we wrap up, I definitely want to talk about the fans. I mean, daytime fans are, there's nothing like them. There's a connection um, that that they make with you and you make with them. Over the years, I mean, Cassie and Hillary, you played characters on multiple shows. All of you probably have, you know, is there something that stands out of a fan connection or just, you know, telling a story that, you know, you've definitely touched someone's life because of the story you, you told on One Life to Live or As the World Turns, or Guiding Light. Is there something that oh, man. stands out? Well, I had one uh, early on. This was late 80s. I went over to the Children's Cancer Ward over at uh, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering. And there were, there were two instances. Uh, one was a young girl, very standoffish, angry. She was angry about what she was going through, everything like that. And I... I don't know what to say to her. She's probably about 12. And I'm just trying to be as nice and comforting as I can. And then at a certain point, the, uh, she said, I don't know why she said, this is going to take my picture with you. I went, sure. I just, I thought she hated my guts and, uh, stood up and took the picture. And, uh, as I walk away afterwards, the, the nurses say she hasn't, gotten out of that bed in over a month. Oh. And the other one was a girl who was 15. She was bald, leukemia patient. And uh, I, you know, she, I said, you know, 
if you get out of here or something, come by the studio and everything like that. And she was just so excited and she was a big fan and everything like that. And I'm at One Life and I'm having a shitty day. Uh, a lot. And so I get paged that someone is upstairs in the in the uh, lobby waiting for me. And I'm like going, and I get on the thing. Like, Who is it? I'm not, I'm not coming up. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. You know, typical Jim the Five of shit. Um, and then they say, as soon as they say the name, my jaw just dropped. And I ran upstairs and she had this big red curly red wig on. She was out of the hospital and in remission. And so it was early on I realized that especially in hospitals, people on soaps really, really connected uh, with people that it was all they had to look forward to till the next day while they went through this grueling, horrible stuff to survive. And, and it, at, that, at that point, I said, you know what, maybe doing a soap is a really good thing. So that was mine. I think doing, playing the character Chelsea and Blair, I mean, especially the gamut of that Blair played, she was both of them were pull you up by the um, bootstrap type of characters and strong women that went through a lot of stuff. Abusive, you know, Todd was as abusive as they come. Um, but it really helped me get through stuff. And when I would meet fans, they would go, oh my gosh, I'm in that situation too. And when you did said that to Todd, you know, when you raised your hand up, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but the fans don't miss a beat. They mm -hmm. remember everything. They're smarter than we give them credit for, I think. And um, they are as loyal as they come. I, that's, that's why I love doing daytime because it's just all part about telling that story and they listen to every little word. Well, the reason I, I'll just show the reason I did this is, you know, because of that connection. They, you know, your show and the shows I worked on, World Terms and Guiding Light, have been off the air for a long time. They miss your faces. And right now, people need a pick me up. So I thank all of you for doing that, you know, because I can see them commenting as we're talking. And I know it's, definitely made a lot of people smile today. But Hillary, please share that story. Well, no, I was just saying the one thing that I loved about my fan base, and I think all of us had the same thing was, um, they got to meet each other. Uh, one, you know, we, we do these fan events, um, especially um, at, you know, ABC, we were doing going down to Disney World and doing oh, that. So fun. But this group of women got together because of me, they joined my fan club. And they, it wasn't so much to be, to know me, it was to meet each other. And to this day, this whole group of girls are really close friends and they, they support each other and they stay in touch and I kind of stay in touch with them. But I think that was the fun thing was um, being the conduit to which other people got to meet each other and form these long lasting friendships. And, and that was kind of cool. I, I can see, you know, I didn't know that because when I was, I'm, you know, I was a soap fan when social media wasn't around. Right. But I can, I can see it as they comment. They're all sort of saying hello to each other. Yeah. All the people, all the people here, like know each other from, you know, being fans of One Life. It's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating. And, they uh, fan events and we got to know them because we'd see them all the time at all these different fan events. But the fact that they, they became friends with each other and outside of us, they became really good friends. And it was kind of nice to know that you brought these wonderful people together to enhance each other's lives. Well, I know for Tuck, because some fans have reached out to me about this, a lot of fans were saying that they met you outside of uh, Boys in the Band. One Life fans had come, you know, to see you in that. Well, you could always tell the One Life fans because they were the ones that knew how to get their way to the front. <laughs> <laughs> They were they were a wily bunch. But, you know, it was really nice to see people who remembered, you know, some of the silly things we did on daytime, yeah. uh, and remember it, um, you know, outside the theater. That was pretty cool. If if there was a you know wizard out there and and Landview could come back to life, would you all participate, partake? Sure. Oh man. Yeah, man. People can walk these days. They'd have to have cue cards. 
<laughs> <laughs> My brain was broke. Yeah. That can be arranged. Oh, I can't even remember, you know. I walk around saying, where's my coffee all the time? My son, for a Christmas one year in my stocking, gave me a tile. You know what that is? Oh, yeah. yeah. Find your yeah. key on your wallet. Right. Yeah. So I've got this little shock oh, no, no. thermos. I keep it in a little thermos thing because by the time I find it, sometimes it was cold. <laughs> so now I've got a tile and uh, I have to go to my phone and you'll hear singing or the little piano. Thing. Oh, it's just like a finder thing. Yeah. yeah, you're supposed to, a lot of people use it for keys. It's like, he's like, what's the matter, Dad? Did you lose your coffee again? Like, <laughs> I have that with my watch and my phone. And my, my daughter laughs every time she hears a ding, 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 ding. Because I can never find my phone. If I've got my coffee and I can't find my phone, I can push the thing and it finds my phone. My phone will make noise. Stop it. Um, I, got those. Yeah. I, now we, I love it. I have to wear a tile and give Loida. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, do I wear it on my forehead? <laughs> We're about to all start talking about our back pain now, aren't we? Yeah. Oh, I actually have a funny story. About back pain? <laughs> about back pain, though. About fans and, and you know, sometimes they people start believing that you're really that person. And they, you know, Hillary doesn't exist. I got a phone call from the office, from the One Life to Live production office calling me wanting to know where Woods was. And I said, <laughs> isn't he on vacation? And they said, yeah. I said, well, we play husband and wife on team. Oh my God. And it really is wife. <laughs> you have to find his real wife and then she can tell you where he is. <laughs> I forgot about that. So funny. Wow, that is good. That is good. Before we all go, uh, we all need to to sing, uh, um, except Hillary, because Hillary's birthday is Monday. Oh. Am I correct? Oh. Yes, you Am are. And and that is thanks to your fans who told me that little secret. So happy birthday, Hillary! Yeah, happy, <laughs> happy birthday! birthday. Happy happy birthday. 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 Birthday, dear Hill. Happy birthday, birthday to you. That's weird. I don't think we were all together. <laughs> no. no. That, that's the, the, the power of my birthday in September. <laughs> we'll come back and say. <laughs> hey, guys, thank you so, so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. The fans. And, uh, about stay back, filling for us. Stay well, back, got, stay backstage. You, you guys can chat. I'll, I'll come say goodbye in a minute. But okay. thank you, everybody. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Wow. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow when we have all my children: Vincent Irizarry, Aiden Turner, Walt Willie, and Jacob Young.